Hello, Mixtresses and Mixters. This is Mixtress Ray. You're watching Mixtress Video. So I thought I would do, like, I don't usually do, like, reviews and, like, flip-throughs of just one deck. Like, usually I do unfair comparisons. Like, because you guys can watch a flip-through of pretty much any deck from anyone other than me. Like, you don't need me for this. But um, I'm just kind of sitting around getting ready for work, and I have this in order because... Usually I scan in my tarot decks um, with a photo scanner so that I can have a digital copy of it, but I don't think I'm going to do it with Crow's Magic because I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but it's glossy, but not only is it glossy, but it has like a, a texture to it which makes the cards stick together. So I'm a little afraid if I put it in the photo scanner because when you use a photo scanner, you like do like stacks of cards at a time or stacks of photos at a time. Um, so I'm a little afraid that they're gonna stick together and then there's gonna be a paper jam and then this, you know, out of print deck will be damaged which I don't usually worry that much about things like that. And I would usually just do it anyway and take the chance because most of the time it's fine, you know, but I think I'm not going to do it with this deck, at least for now. So it's in order and I think I'm not going to actually scan it in. So this is my card of the day. So you're going to see the judgment card first. Oh, what I wanted to share with you guys too, I was able to, I'm going to be borrowing the Crow's Magic guidebook um, from the Library of Congress. It's like a situation where like I can't take it out of the library, but I can look at it in the library. So hopefully I will be able to scan in the content of the Crow's Magic guidebook because apparently that goes for like 300 plus dollars on eBay because it's so scarce. The like because I was able to get this deck, even though it's out of print, I was able to get it for um, $50, including shipping. So a little expensive for me for one deck, but that's fine. <laughs> it was it was in great condition. I don't even know if it's really been used before me. Um, I mean, the box was, I mean, the box is fine. It's just, you know, slightly damaged. Anyway, so I just thought I would sit and flip through these cards and kind of talk about my thoughts of this using this tarot deck so far. I've only had it for like four days, but five days, something like that. I don't know. But it is a delightful little weirdo and I really like it. So anyway, just, just to let you know that hopefully I will be able to I want to create a PDF scan of the guidebook whenever I have access to it. Um, I've, I probably will be scanning it like with my phone instead of putting it on a scanner because I don't want to break the spine because I want to be super respectful because like the only library that had this in my, in my library's interlibrary loan system, the only library that had access to this guidebook was Library of Congress. And so they have that stipulation where you can't take it out of the library. So I'll have to look at it in the library. And I don't know if I want to try to put it flat down on the scanner because I don't want to break the spine or anything like that. So anyway, I don't know how good the PDF quality is going to be whenever I scan it in, but I want to make it available for people. I'm just saying, like, I don't know exactly how that's going to work or how long it'll even take for me to get this deck in my hand or get this guidebook in my hands. Or if it's even going to work out, to be honest. But I'm just letting you guys know that a PDF could be coming. Because this is an interesting guidebook. I have a friend that has it that, like, when I pull my card of the day, she reads um, the guidebook definitions for me. That's been really fun. And it's very interesting. Just like the art. It's weird. It's It's like something about this artwork. Now I'm feeling guilty that I'm showing you. <laughs> Suddenly I'm feeling guilty that I'm showing you guys a deck that's out of print. Um, the thing, okay, so I have not been collecting tarot for that long, you know, just like not even barely three years. So the thing that I have noticed, like if, 
if you find yourself wanting an out of print deck and like you look on eBay and there's like two people selling it and they're listed for like, you know, $200 or some bullshit like that. Oftentimes those two listings that you find that are super expensive have been there forever because some people are not willing to pay that. And so if you just set up a saved search or something like that, or just, you know, I mean, I know how hard it is whenever you think I want that thing. I want that thing now. Like I know how hard it is to wait in those moments, but if you can, most of the time you can find something that you can find it for a reasonable price somewhere. Like somebody that doesn't know it's worth can be selling it for 30 bucks and you, and you can, the timing can work out that you can get it, you know, or sometimes like what I did with this one, it was listed for quite a bit more than when I paid for it, but it had a best offer option. Like go in there, put in your actual best offer, put in what you actually want to pay for it. The worst they can do is tell you no, you know? I mean, that's not really advice. That's <laughs> how to buy things on the internet. You guys know, but. What is going on with the like religious symbolism? I'm sure it explains it in the in the guidebook. Um, let's see what the little white book has to say. Does it explain why the moon card is lunacy and delusion and why there are these religious symbols on it? Let's see. Divinatory meaning, adjusting thinking, a new approach, inspired by the moon's forces, genius or insanity. Reverse meaning, indulging in mind-altering practices or devices, staying down and out. So sometimes the, the meanings in the guidebook, both this little white book and also the guidebook, the big guidebook, are just like totally nonsensical in a really fun way. And sometimes they're totally nonsensical in a very nonsensical way. <laughs> um, but sometimes they're just really great. Like the one for judgment today um, that my friend read to me is, um, it's amazing. It has like phrases like, think about things until they become visions. Um, listen to the sky. <laughs> And I mean, that might sound nonsensical to some people, but to me, that that does make sense for a judgment card, right? This is a very, like, it has a very shamanic feel to it in a way that as a white person, I don't feel like this is a type of shamanism that I shouldn't have access to, if that makes sense. Um, cause in the past, like I, certain decks have felt like maybe it's not for me. Maybe I should, you know, leave it for non-white people, but this one doesn't feel that way. This feels shamanic in a way that is accessible to me. It's almost like shamanic in a way that anyone, particularly anyone that lives in America has access to, not necessarily that like people not in America should have access to whatever type of shamanism is happening here. Um, that's not what I'm saying. It's just, I feel like there's a certain level of, um, does that make sense? There's a certain level of shamanism that just exists in the land when you live in America. It's here. Even if it's not part of your personal culture, it's here. And you do have some access to it. I love a pterodactyl. And I love that the astrological symbols are on every card. I've noticed that some of them I do not agree with. Um or aren't the way that I've learned it. I'll have to point that out when we get there. 
this is just, it's so 1998, right? So 1998. I'm really excited to be able to have access to the guidebook and I definitely want to share it because I know that that's something that like, you know, I never would be able to buy that guidebook. Like somebody's either going to get super lucky and find it like in a thrift store or in a used bookstore for 10 bucks or whatever, or they're going to pay a ridiculous amount of money for it. Which I mean, like, I tend to be kind of like, I don't know, I'm very like black and white about like spending too much for things. <laughs> um, but you know, if you have the money and it's worth it to you, like, I'm not trying to judge that. But I just want it to be accessible. So I mean, a PDF of this guidebook might already exist that people are sharing around. Um, and I can see that like, there might be like some legal shit legal. It might be illegal for me to share a PDF of the guidebook once I get access to it. But in my mind, like if it's something that's out of print that you can't fucking find for a reasonable price, it should be available for people. I think <laughs> I work in a library and have for the last 17 years. I think all information should be free. Pips with feeling. <laughs> That's what Sylvain said in one of his recent videos. That he likes Pip-like cards with feeling. And I do too. I think it's a great balance whenever you have room in artwork to create your own interpretations. But it's not like just nine cups or whatever. Like there's a little bit more to it than that. There's a jumping off point. in your um, imagination, you know. I'm not really saying much about this imagery, but I do find it just like very accessible. It's just like, it's simple imagery. I love the sort of like, it reminds me of, oh my God, do any of you guys remember this? Like every time I bring this up, people don't know what I'm talking about. It was something, it was like a video, like v on VHS series. And it was like, the first one was called The Mind's Eye. And it was kind of like, it's kind of like the Anna Music series. It was sort of like, it was music and computer animation that was done in possibly the late 80s. I don't know. But the first one was called The Mind's Eye. And the second one was called Beyond the Mind's Eye. And it was just like this sort of sort of music video experience <laughs> in the early days of computer animation and this art reminds me of that and it just gives me such a nostalgic feeling it's almost like too retro to be 1998 to be honest like this reminds me more of like 1992 but I mean, Londa Marx could have started working on this deck back then, even. A lot of the keywords in this case, like, a lot of them I don't agree with. However, they're so different that, like, I'm kind of okay with disagreeing with it, if that makes sense. But, I mean... For me, whenever I get a deck with keywords, I always talk myself into being okay with the keywords at first, and then later I get salty about it. So we'll see if that happens with this one, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not a person that has, because I've only been collecting tarot for like less than three years, I don't have a lot of out of print decks or anything like that. In fact, let me just look at my collection real quick. I've heard that Tarot of the Cat People is becoming hard to find, and I have that one. And then, of course, I have some indie decks that might, like, currently be out of print or something like that. Like, I have Desert Illuminations, and I have Moon Power sometimes goes out of print, but then it comes back. 
goth Nancy might currently be. Like, there was just a Kickstarter for it. I mean, I have a few things that, like, might not currently be something that you can buy, but I think this is the only thing that's, like, out of print that I have. And it does... I wonder how much of, like, how much of my reverence for this deck has to do with it being out of print. I do genuinely think that no matter what, I would want to have this tarot deck. Because when I first saw it, um, like two years ago or so, might have even been like three or four years ago was the first time that I saw this tarot deck. Because I love crow imagery. I love it so much. And like, I want like a crow tarot, but most of the crow tarots that are out there are just not for me. And this one isn't like, even though it's called Crow's Magic, it's not just crows, which is fine. But like, anyway, when I first discovered this tarot deck, I was like, yes, I need to have that. I love that art style. It's so weird. I need it. Um, but I wasn't willing to pay the money for it um, until I just got lucky, you know, and that's how it goes. Maybe, and some of that process probably makes me have more respect for it too, because I knew that I didn't want to pay the exorbitant prices that it's listed for a lot of the time. So I was patient enough to wait until I could get it for a price that felt reasonable to me. I actually used um, the funds that I made from selling the nameless one to buy this deck. So that felt right to me to like, you know take something that I didn't want and it was pretty much the exact same price too because I ended up getting $46 plus shipping for the nameless one and I paid $45 plus shipping for this so it worked out to almost the exact same amount. I mean I, I think I was out like a couple of dollars or like five bucks of my own money just because eBay takes some of those for fees. So like it turned out that I, it wasn't an exact match, but it was close enough. <laughs> Bliss and comfort. So yeah, I haven't really been commenting on the artwork at all as I'm doing this. I'm just talking about other shit, but yeah. So I guess this can just, this is just segueing into sort of a conversation about um, the, the scarcity mindset, you know, like how much does something being out of print that you're able to get your hands on influence your love of it? You know, like I'll probably never really know how I would have felt about this tarot deck had I, you know, had it not been scarce, you know? I think I would have liked, I think I like it. I think I really like it. I think I'm an authentic enough person that doesn't give a shit about money enough to say that this is for me. I think I'd like to think that about myself, but is it really true? How much am I influenced by just sort of like the consumerist capitalist world? See how I can riffle shuffle again, guys? <laughs> I'm still wearing my brace most of the time. I don't know if you can see, but like, yeah, you totally can. Like, there's still, it's like my bone is messed up forever. <laughs> anyway, whatever. It's been six weeks. I guess if it continues to hurt for another month or so, I might have to like go see a hand doctor and be like, dude, is there a ligament broken in here? Do I need surgery? Which is fine. I mean, I will do it. If I need hand surgery, I will do it. Anyway. Um, what do we got? Five of Wands, Turmoil and Disorder, Four of co Coins, Miser, and Security. So, I, I guess it's just, it's just a thought. It's just a thought that I've been having. Like, you know, about collecting. And like, sure, there's a certain level of like, I do feel special to have this tarot deck. I feel kind of special because 
it's somewhat scarce, right? I mean, it's not that scarce. You can find it. You can find it. <laughs> it's just not in print anymore. That's all. But you can find it. It is a bit elusive and mythical, but you can find it. <laughs> and to be honest, the cardstock. Okay, it's not the cardstock. For me, I'm fine with, like, you see how it's, like, kind of bent? <clears throat> like, it gets really weirdly bent, too, like, when you shuffle it. It's not the normal just, like, bow in the middle kind of situation. It gets all... <laughs> it's... Yeah. But it's it's thin cardstock, but I'm okay with that. That doesn't bother me. The thing that bothers me is, like, the toothy gloss that's the finish on the cards that kind of makes it somewhat hard to shelf to flip through like it's not as bad as like a fucking buttery mat or anything how cool is this tower card super cool anyway i'm loving this deck i am loving it but <laughs> yeah i could definitely also see if you acquired this deck back in the late 90s or early 2000s, I could see how you'd be like, this is real fucking weird, dude. And then get rid of it, you know? I could also see having that opinion, despite the fact that I'm really fucking loving it right now. It's just something that I've, I think about, you know? Like, how much of my thoughts are my own, you know? Do you ever think about that? How much of who I think I am is really who I am and how much of it is a reaction to what's around me, a, a reaction to society or, yeah. I mean, we'll never really know. We can't ever completely separate ourselves from the things that we've been taught since birth, you know? It's kind of like gender. I firmly believe the gender is a fucking idea in our heads. It's not real. <laughs> but that doesn't take away your experience of gender in this world because we've made it real. It's just like this fucking tarot deck that has like somewhat shitty cardstock and has, you know... It is valuable because we've decided it's valuable, you know? We've decided it's worth money because it's not really super readily available. We've decided that its scarcity makes it worth something. And yeah, it's cool. It's still cool. Like, I'm not saying anything against this tarot deck. I think it's awesome. I like it. I was willing to pay $50 for it. But, um... I don't know. Does any of this shit make sense? I'm going to shut up now because, yeah, I want to actually be able to upload this video. I fucking love birds. Birds are my thing. I love them. <laughs> this, this is cheesy as fuck. I mean, look at these lions. Look at the lion faces. Anyway, what do you guys think about that? Like the relationship to scarcity. Like, do you have anything in your life that is supposed to be valuable that, that you don't find valuable that you think you should? I mean, there are things in life that like somehow you get a hold of that, you know, are valuable in society. So you think that you should hang on to them. You know, there are those things. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I, I have the opposite response too. Like if I have something that other people think is valuable, I have to get rid of it because it's like, I mean, a lot of times it's been because of money. There have been times in my life whenever I've like sold a tarot deck that I did like because it was scarce and I felt like I shouldn't have it if someone else could get better use out of it. I felt like I need to be worthy of having a thing that other people really, really want. Like, if I'm not using it properly, I should get rid of it. I've had that before, but I've also just gotten rid of something before because it was worth a lot of money because I fucking needed the money, you know? Um, I don't know. I don't really know what I'm saying, except 
Question everything, children. Question everything. Totality and wholeness. All right, that's it. This is just a little appreciation of Crow's Magic Tarot slash discussion on scarcity and value. What does it mean? Like I recently, okay, apparently I'm not done shutting up. I recently had, um, I talked about this on my radio show. So those of you that listen to my radio show are going to um, be like, yeah, I already heard all this bitch. But I um, recently did a whiskey tasting, like blind taste test thing. And um, I was very surprised by the results because I love whiskey, um, bourbon particularly, bourbon whiskey. I love bourbon whiskey. And having a blind taste test, I actually do not have a discerning palate at all, guys. Like the one that was my favorite in the blind taste test that I was like, this is the superior one. I love it give it to me. What is it? How much does it cost? Evan Williams, eleven ninety nine a bottle usually where I live. <laughs> Evan Williams was my favorite whiskey in the blind taste test. But I did another blind taste test and it was a totally different whiskey that was my favorite. And <laughs> it, it just, I, I don't even know what's real anymore when it, when it comes to that kind of stuff. You know, it's like Coke versus Pepsi. I've never done that challenge before, the Coke versus Pepsi challenge, but I've heard that a lot of people can't tell the difference. And in my mind, it's like, that's crazy. I know the difference. Pepsi is smoother and sweeter and Coke is grittier and more bitter, right? Like that's the way I think of Coke versus Pepsi, but I probably wouldn't actually know the difference in the end. You know, how much value do we place on things because of what we've been told about them, you know? I just think it's an interesting question and yeah, I, um, yeah, <laughs> I just wonder how much, how much we're lying to ourselves about things in life, about how much some, something, how much value something has and, you know, treat things with respect if they're scarce. Absolutely. Um, you know, like I want to treat the Crow's Magic guidebook with as much respect as possible because it's a thing that's hard to find and people want access to it. And the more respect you give to a physical book in the universe, the more people can enjoy it, right? Um, that's why places like the Library of Congress exist <laughs> to archive things, to give people access to things. Um, yeah, anyway. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore, so I'm just going to shut up. Thank you guys for listening. Bye.